Uh, well, you know what's coming. That's right. A major television star from the show Mythbusters. Uh, Brandon Lamar, that's right. I, uh, we're very lucky, lucky to have him here. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, asked him many times in the past, and he always said no. I know. It hurt, it hurt my feelings at the time, but I'm over it now because he's here. I'm very excited. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the intro that I saw somebody had written some notes for introducing somebody else and stuck it on the wall backstage for some other show. So I feel like it's appropriately surreal. Five voices, no instruments. Just won the sing-off last week. Your eyes won't believe what your ears are hearing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brandon Mahar. Thank you. I've never had an introduction as part of that moment. And you never tell me to. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I believe that most of you will know me from Mythbusters on the Discovery Channel. We've been on the air for 10 years now using science to prove or disprove urban legends. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight, unfortunately. But if you do have questions, I'll be happy to tell you all about the next season of Mythbusters uh, at office hours right after dinner at the uh, Dog and Badger Pub. And normally, when I give this talk, I, I talk a little bit about the show, some funny behind-the-scenes stories, like about how Jamie didn't have uh, a bray, always. It's not the first hat that he ever wore. In fact, the first hat that he wore was a bowler. <laughs> it's absolutely true. When he was a dive master, in the Caribbean, not far from where we are now. And he would wear that and not much else. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I figured that with this cruise, with this group of people, that you'd want to have something a little bit more than just the standard Mythbusters talk. I wanted to give you something that really had been secret for over 10 years, that, that we were forbidden to speak about outside of certain circles. <laughs> Believe me, it will make sense in a moment. Just stay with me. Now, in 1977, there was a movie called Star Wars. I assume you're all familiar with it. Is there anybody who's not? Okay, good. Go up to deck five right now. Step directly off. This is not the cruise for you. Sorry, no, no, it's good to sense. Yeah, okay. Um, in 1977, the movie Star Wars, which changed my life, I was uh, seven years old. I know I don't look like it, but I was. To two of the characters which spoke to me, the two robots, C-3PO and R2-D2, C-3PO being the taller, gold, fussy, British-sounding one, and R2-D2 being the trash can one. <laughs> Now, if you know any of the, the history, if you've heard things, you've heard that I've been an official R2-D2 operator, and that is, that is true. And that's a story for another night, because, again, I'm going to talk about something else. So, the character of C-3PO, you know, sort of a, a British butler, very fussy, that sort of thing. Um, well, played by a fussy Englishman named Anthony Daniels. Now, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, this is his character, and believe me, he was the guy who was in the suit, has been in the suit since 1977. Not continuously, but you know. <laughs> he is the only person to portray this character, and it's his mannerisms and his voice. 
But I'm here to tell you tonight that with very few exceptions, he has been. But there are exceptions. And I am one of them. You see, for 10 years, I led a secret life. I worked with, not unlike here at the Joko Cruise, there's a shadow cruise. Inside of the media giant that is Lucasfilm, there was a shadow department, a department which is not spoken of officially. That department is called Lucasfilm Character Appearance. And what happens is, if you need a Wookiee, a Darth Vader, uh, R2, C3PO, even an Ewok, anywhere in the world, in an official capacity, you can hire this team. If you can find them, and it's a team. So, I mean, we had our own Chewbacca, our own Darth Vader, um, and, and it was a good time for 10 years. Now, how does one get started being the C-3PO that appears in the Burger King commercial? You might ask. <laughs> I asked it myself. Let's just take a moment and step back. So since 2005, I've been working on Mythbusters. That's a good, you know, a good run. Ten years almost. Before that, I worked in Industrial Light and Magic as a model maker and animatronics engineer. Also a good run. And before that, for a few years, I worked at Lucasfilm THX on Skywalker Ranch. And just for reference, I graduated USC in 1993. So, virtually right after graduation, I was working at THX. My friend Don Bees was running the archives. They needed a C-3PO, but they didn't want to fly Tony Dennis. He lives in England, and he's fussy and British. <laughs> they needed somebody to appear as C-3PO, and, well, he would record the audio and then they would simply appear and do the miming. And so, I was having lunch with Don and my other friend Nelson Hall, and they got this kind of crazy look in their eyes. They're like, what are you doing after lunch? <laughs> I don't know, in those days I was blowing up loudspeakers and amplifiers for THX. Like, come to the archive building. We've got something for you. Because in Marin County, California, in 1994, Lucasfilm had a, an event called the Star Wars Summit. It was for licensees to kind of get them going. And they didn't have the C3PO, you know, so they needed someone, anyone, someone they could trust, though, to be in the suit and portray the character. So after lunch, I went over to Don's archive building, they put me in the suit, and they put the head on and everything, and it wasn't until they flipped the switch on the back, this battery pack on your back, that turns on the eyes, that they both took a step back and they said, wow, I knew we had something there. So, what's the suit like, right? You want to know? So, here's the basic suit. Okay. You have a cowl, by the way. You wear a whole body stocking. Which was my first experience with the body stocking. <laughs> it was a little uncomfortable at first, but you get used to it. There were 17 separate pieces in the suit mostly composed of fiberglass, some aluminum bits, some steel, there's some connecting hardware, and then there's this. <laughs> this is a pair of vinyl trunks that are fairly thick. I don't know why they're so thick, but they're thick. They're about quarter inch thick, like maybe the thickness of your paint. In order to put these on, this is pretty much the first step of putting on the costume, 
They have to be heated. <laughs> because you see, in their natural state, they're very rigid. So you heat them up. This is, they're actually sitting on uh, a heating unit right there. And then you kind of do a little dance. It's a little shimmy. Which I had to do many, many times. But I'll tell you more about the, the trunks in a moment. Now if you get the trunks on, then come the legs, the shoes, the shins. There's a corset, by the way, that you wear. Um, and that has wires sewn into it and zips up the side. <laughs> then you get the beavis and butthead cowl over your head. <laughs> then comes the chest. Chest goes on. And it's starting to feel a little constricting now. They secure the chest together and then put on the arms. And, um, well, after that, you're pretty much ready to rock and roll. Now, people say, Tony Daniels did such an amazing job conceptualizing what a robot, what a humanoid robot, would walk like. This is 1977. There was no uh, Honda robot. There were no Sony dancing robots. There was nothing. And so people were like, well, he should walk kind of like a human, but he should also be somewhat mechanical. And now, he did such a brilliant job of figuring out what this would be like. <laughs> and now we come back to these trunks. You see, the whole thing where he can't, he kind of shuffles along, doesn't really do much dancing, Unfortunately, that is because of these trunks. <laughs> and everything else that you see, the movements of the upper body, that's because the chest piece is all one piece. And your shoulders are able to rotate, but your forearms are also all one piece. And so when you put that all together, you kind of get this. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> What's it like inside the suit? Well, if you can imagine being encased head to toe in fiberglass, aluminum, vinyl, and various other materials, you would imagine that it's very confining. And in fact, it is. First of all, you can't sit down because of the trunks of doom. So you have to find a, a leaning surface. Usually, that's a ladder. <laughs> if you're lucky and they like you on set, they'll give you a little packing blanket behind it. Yeah, C-3PO's chair. You can't see very much. The holes in the eyes are, again, about a quarter inch, about the size of your pinky. Seeing below this level, pretty much non-existent. In fact, if it's dark, you better hope that you're doing an appearance with R2, because R2's got lights on the back of his head, and that's all that you can see. <laughs> you can't breathe. You can barely speak. Anything you try and say will be muffled beyond comprehension. And it's very, very hot. You try and find any surface, really, to lean on. Maybe it's your friends. You don't have a ladder available. So, it's not the easiest gig in the world, but, you know, it's super cool, nonetheless. <laughs> so, when you hear about various stars going to Japan and selling things, uh, Kevin Costner, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, big action stars, 
But they're selling weird stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't associate with them. Not like a power drink or ammunition or things like that. They're selling food and noodles and ham. Well, R2-D2 and C-3PO are no different from any of those stars. They make a few bucks on the side. And because of those agreements, you can't see what they're here in America. You can't see what they're selling in Japan. So what do R2-D2 and C-3PO sell in Japan? They sell cars, apparently. <laughs> and in fact, they sell minivans for some reason. Like, maybe they're starting some kind of robot family and they need more space? I don't know, but... So, you can see, I'm sitting in this, by the way, now I said, you can't sit down. It's true. You can't sit down in the costume. I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> you do what you have to do to get the job done. So, uh, we're shooting this commercial. They flew us all around the world to Japan, Turkey, everywhere they needed to sell something using these characters, we'd, we'd go there and pretty much show up. And here I am in the, the Mitsubishi showroom in Japan, which is a fake showroom, along with the Mitsubishi spokesperson, um, who had great fondness for C-3PO. <laughs> now, one of the shows that we did was for Oprah Winfrey. And when I say Oprah owns Chicago, I'll explain that in a second. But needless to say, Oprah Winfrey was shooting her show for many years in Chicago. Very well-liked, very powerful person. And I was working at THX, uh, at ILM, actually, in those days. And I had to work a full shift. I couldn't break away. I had to work, I had a day job. And I was just doing this on the side. And so my boss was like, no, no, you can't get away. You have to, we need you to work here. And then you can go and be C-3PO. Like, okay, fine, I'll do it. So I worked a full day. Took the red eye, or a late afternoon flight into Chicago. Got there, I was the last one in. I get to the front desk. And the guy checking me in says, oh, Mr. Imahar. Oh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, here we go. Yes, we don't have any more rooms. This is the Omni Hotel in Chicago! You don't have any more rooms? I'm sorry, sir. Oh, but I see you with the Oprah Winfrey Show. Well, sir, the presidential suite is available. <laughs> Like, I think that'll do nicely, yes. <laughs> so I go to the bar, which is where everybody goes. And I go, guys, 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 come on upstairs. I'm like, what? I got the presidential suite. You have to check this out. So we all go upstairs to my room. It's got a 12-person dining table, a TV that rises out of our credenza. It's got two entrances, two separate bathrooms. One bathroom had a toilet and a bidet. It was the first time I'd ever seen that in real life. <laughs> I didn't touch it, by the way. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't play it. <laughs> and then, this is how you know that this was the presidential suite, because they had a giant rear screen projection TV with a stack of laser discs like this. <laughs> And every porn channel was free. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was just flipping through. <laughs> Sadly, I only got to, uh, to stay there one night. But Oprah was really super nice, and, and her people are really efficient. And yes, we had an Ewok. It's Margarita Fernandez. And, and that's the funny thing, is like, with this gig for so many years, they're like, what do you, you know, I, I was on the Oprah Winfrey show. I'm like, no, you weren't. I'm like, yeah, that was me, in the suit, right there. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know, it was somewhere special. And she wanted to walk out with the Ewok, the Ewok and me, and the Ewok was doing somersaults. It was pretty cute. <laughs> now, Rupert and the X-Wing. So, Fox Studios Australia was starting to film Star Wars Episode One. And they wanted to, I know. <laughs> All right, look, I worked on it, that's true. I didn't do Jar Jar. Okay, I just get that out of the way. I did all the cool parts. <laughs> Federation Battleship, all right? Um, they were opening Fox Studios Australia. They're having a big gala event, all-star event. They have people from all over the world, including, let's see here, Charlie Sheen, Kate Blanchett, Florence Anderson, and it was hosted by pre-Wolverine Hugh Jackman, <laughs> who is an amazing singer, which we know now from Les Mis, but back then, we're like, what? Really? <laughs> the event, so we had an all day long event, and then the culmination of this was in a stadium at Fox Studios, where I, in the C-3PO outfit, was going to enter a code given to me by Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> and then fireworks go off, and it's crazy, and, and by the way, see how little resemblance Rupert Murdoch has to Emperor Palpatine? <laughs> So we entered the thing, and they actually flew a full-size X-Wing and landed it on stage. And that was uh, a 10-year run. All kinds of things. Lego, Burger King, ESPN, Walmart, Mitsubishi. But I think out of that 10-year career, my favorite appearance of all time, had to be the opening of the re-release of Star Wars. The 20-year anniversary, 1997, Westwood, California, outside the Mangrove Theater, 10 o'clock in the morning. We're there, and they had taken all of the characters they could muster to make a red carpet event using aliens. And they had all the characters that had um, Greedo, and you know, they were making up characters, just trying to throw people together and walk down the red carpet. And then they had all of us. And in addition to all of us, R2, 3PO, Darth Vader, Chewbacca, they invited Hollywood stars, A-listers, to come to this Star Wars premiere. And you wouldn't know who these fans of Star Wars were, but Sure enough, I'm there, standing outside the Mangrove Theater, in the C-3PO costume, standing with R2 right here. I am right there, 1977. I had the light blue Star Wars sheets with the Luke Skywalker, the lunchbox, and the action figures, I had it all. And I'm in the C-3PO costume, standing next to R2-D2 and Carrie Fisher, <laughs> Princess Leia herself, walks in. She walks up, and she's with Sharon Stone, because, I don't know, they were like howling around those days, and I didn't care about Sharon Stone, but I was like, oh my god, Carrie Fisher. <laughs> Carrie Fisher sees me. She makes a beeline to me, and she comes right up, just like, in, 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 where she tilts her head just inside, and she looks right, and she knows, out of all these people, she knows exactly where to look, to look right in my eyes, until those two little eyeballs where you can't really see anything else. And she looks at me and she goes, Who are you? <laughs> so talk to me. Okay, okay, good cool. And the moment was gone. <laughs> that, 
However, what is the most amazing moment of that day? Because you see, also being a child of the 80s, in Los Angeles, I grew up in LA, the LA Lakers were our basketball team. They were our dynasty. They were one of the top teams in the NBA. There was a rivalry between the LA Lakers and the Boston Celtics. In the late 80s, that was, that was the thing. The captain of that basketball team was Magic Johnson. All-star, Hall of Famer, tremendous athlete, and a very tall man. <laughs> I'm standing there with R2 in C-3PO costume, and Magic Johnson comes walking up. <gasps> oh my god, it's Magic Johnson. And at that moment, Magic Johnson says, oh my god, C-3PO, I love you. <laughs> Now, I'll preface this by saying, you remember how difficult it is to breathe, to see, you can't see below this plane, you can't really hear all that well, you can't sit down, and you're very, very, very hot. Magic Johnson, captain of the Los Angeles Lakers, a tremendous athlete with incredible reflexes, comes up and says, Oh my God, C-3PO, I love you, I want to shake your hand. And Magic Johnson puts out his hand, and instinctively, instinctively, although I could not see below this plane, I went with my hand. Thank God, he's an amazing athlete with quick reflexes. <laughs> because that is how I almost touched Magic Johnson. <laughs> and uh, thank you to Jonathan Coulter and Paul and Shaw and Tom Richard. Uh, 